often, uh, uh, as, a, as a pastor, it's hard to wean people away from religion. I just want to remind you, as far as I'm concerned, a time like Resurrection Sunday can be important because a lot of people begin to feel a little emotional and a little religious, a little responsible to God, just like that, that on Christmas. But, but so-called Easter and Christmas and the rest of those days are really meaningful to me in a very limited sense. Um, to look at the Lord's birth in a time such a, a, as Christmas, one time a year, and then treat him as though he were never born the rest of the time is abject hypocrisy and something that I personally despise. Uh, celebrating uh, uh, Easter or Resurrection uh, Sunday and then live the rest of the year as though he were not living himself, which is what the rest of the world does. Uh, and the Apostle Paul tells us that we're not to be judged with respect to days. And it, it does become difficult, so if we, we break our routine and the like and come and do these, uh, these special times. And I guess that's okay in a way, and that's fine. We'll continue doing it. But to you as a grace believer, special days should, I mean, it, it, they're, they're really meaningless. What does it mean? Is it, is it more important to keep coming back to his resurrection, which is what all religions do, a, a Christian uh, sex, or to know the power of his resurrection every day of your life? Amen. Uh, so uh, just... Just to put it in context, because we get bombarded and we get to thinking we've got to be just like the rest of the world. And I'm telling you, unless the rest of the world is Pauline, you shouldn't be like the rest of the world. All right, now I'm going to get off on one soapbox and on the other here. Uh, because I just, I just want to keep reminding this congregation, we are not religious. We do not have a religion. We are not going to be denominational. We will never be as long as I'm here. What we will be is biblical, and that is the most important thing. Uh, when we start letting the world set our agenda and our uh, uh, spiritual calendar is when we get in trouble. Uh, there are certain exceptions and, and uh, limitations, and that's fine. But we need to be mindful of that. And one of the reasons that, uh, that I am uh, uh, mindful of it is because of what we're going to be talking about. Today, all across uh, our city, there are going to be uh, Easter services, and there's going to be communion. And people are going to take communion. You know what they're going to do? They're going to take it unworthily. They're either not going to be saved, they're going to use it as a means toward their salvation, or they're going to take it out of fellowship because they don't know straight up from how to get back in fellowship and spirit-filled, and they're going to take it unworthily. We say, Pastor, so what? At least they're performing a religious ritual and it brings them closer to God. And that is nonsense. If you take communion and you take it unworthily, you uh, stand to, to reap uh, the um, judgment of God on your life. And I believe that there are a whole lot of people who take communion. They're a good religious person and they're, they're faithful to their church. Well, I gave Easter and Christmas this past year and uh, what more does God want? And then all of a sudden they take communion and God strikes them down. God uh, uh, smites them with, uh, with some disease. And they don't understand, but I've been good, God. You owe me this. And the reason was is they came to, to an uh, Easter service. And they took communion, and they weren't worthy to take it. So it's, uh, communion can be a very, very serious thing. So that's why we're going to spend all day today on communion. Uh, the first hour is going to be dedicated to it. The second hour, as much as we have time for it, and then the third hour will be dedicated to it. Especially with regard to the communion elements. We'll define those in a little bit. But uh, often... We mentioned this part of a communion uh, service and that part of a communion service. And what we're going to try to do is to package them together and look at each and every aspect of the communion service and what it means uh, for God the Father, what it meant for Jesus Christ, and what it means for us. Now just some uh, vocabulary to get you um, uh, uh, in the direction we want. This is called by Paul, as we'll see in this study, the Lord's Supper. 
And the reason that it is, is that he is the one that's providing the food, as it were. He's the one providing the drink, the place. Uh, he is going to be the host of it all. And we are his guests. And that's how you have to look at a uh, thing as a, as a communion service. Uh, in the Lord's Supper, there are several things that are focused on, and each one has a great significance. One is the Lord's cup, and that's what it's called. Also, his wine, very specific type of wine. The Lord's table, and then on the table will be the bread. And all of these are the communion elements, and then from, from them there is even more that's to be considered. Now, the second thing then that we need to do at this point is get a definition of communion and elements. When we talk about communion, we're talking about a Greek word. It's koinonia. We'll see it in a little bit when we get to um, our first uh, scripture. But a communion is a fellowship. Now the interesting thing about this is that in the first communion, Jesus Christ also partook of the bread and he partook of the wine. He ate it and he drank it. Uh, and we'll show you scriptures where uh, uh, he does that. In other words, um, what he is doing by that is showing his own participation in what the Lord's table is, is all about. And that is communion, fellowship together. He died to bring many sons to glory. He was the glorified Son of God, but the reason he was here was to bring other people into a, a relationship with God like that that he has. And so it is called a communion, a koinonia. Now, koinonia comes from the root word koine in the Greek, and koine Greek is common Greek. Something they all had in common, something that they all did, they all spoke, they all understood. There's no misunderstanding with something that each one had in common. So one word meant one thing to all people. And with this, uh, the very same thing applies. If you're saved, then you have participated in something that I participated in, because I'm saved, and we hold it in common. And when we look at the cross, when we look at Christ, when we see all that he did, uh, you share equally in a common property. Uh, and that is the new covenant and its uh, uh, salvation benefits. But you all would also jointly participate in a common activity. What is that? Eating and drinking of the blood of Christ and then eating the body of Christ. So that's what the communion is. And um, as we'll see, eating and drinking is a symbol. And it is one of the most familiar symbols that, that God could give. It's the easiest to understand. We all understand drinking. We all understand eating. We all understand a table. We all understand a cup. And we all understand uh, supper. You know, the old phrase, you can call me this, you can call me that, just don't call me late for supper. So that's, the, um, that's the communion part. When you have a supper... Everybody comes to the table and partakes of the same food and drink. And the eating and the drinking picture receiving the, the spirit and contents of, of the gospel so that we're saved. Secondly is the word elements. Uh, last uh, Friday night at the uh, 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 game night, Steve Irwin said that there was a kid uh, was he a chemistry student, I guess, or he was a student? Uh, and he came and, and uh, he was having a pe petition and uh, he was trying to get uh, these people to sign uh, as a protest uh, to the environmental destruction that we see out there. And it, it, the protest was against something that was very, very toxic. And so people were signing it right and left. Uh, and uh, it was dihydrogen oxide. People said, boy, that's bad. That's, that's uh, something that's really toxic. It's really going to hurt us. And so, and so we got to hundreds and hundreds of signatures to ban dihydrogen oxide. People being environmentally friendly and the like. Well, dihydrogen oxide is H2O or water. 
Uh, but uh, that's how much uh, they knew. And Steve, I'm sorry, I think I signed that when the kid came around. <laughs> well, oxide threw me off. Oxide, oxide, I knew H2O. All right. But all those things are elements. You have to have two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen to make the water. That's it, it's elements. If you only had one part, uh, or two parts hydrogen and no parts uh, uh, oxygen, you could never get water. You have to have everything contained as ingredients in order uh, for the substance to be seen or realized. Uh, same thing in, in baking or cooking. If you want to make a cake, a pie, you've got to have all the ingredients of flour, water, milk, eggs, uh, uh, whatever. They've all got to be mixed in. If you miss an ingredient, it would be like what you wanted to make, but there'd still be something missing. So the same thing is true of the Lord's Supper. You've got to have all of these components. A, uh, an element is a component or a constituent part essential to the composition of the whole, and without which the whole wouldn't be what it should. If you just drank the wine without eating the bread, it really wouldn't be communion, what we're talking about. Or ate the bread and didn't drink the wine. Or if you ate it unworthily. Or if you ate it uh, wanting it to do something other than what God intended. All of the ingredients have to be a part. Otherwise, communion is not communion in uh, that sense. So when we're talking about communion elements, we're talking about some specific things, all of which must be present <laughs> in order for it to be a communion service. Okay, so here we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse number 16. What does a communion service portray? It says here in verse number 16, so we read on down, skipping the first sentence, is not it the communion of the blood of Christ? Now, every single one of us, as is shown by our uh, picture, this 1 Corinthians 10, 16, reading down from the first sentence of the, the verse, is not it the communion of the blood of Christ? So that means when you come to the Lord's table, you are saying something about the blood. Now, when we talk about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to realize something, as we'll see later on. Though the blood literally had to come from his veins, Jesus Christ did not bleed to death. The blood is another picture of a picture. The blood is a picture of his soul work. Uh, the work of Christ on the cross was twofold. One was his soul, pictured by the blood, and the other was uh, his body, pictured by the bread. And so when we say about the blood, Jesus Christ did not bleed to death. How do you know that? I know it because he said, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down in myself. And right at the specific hour, the other two thieves were still alive, but right at the exact time when the Passover would be killed, between the evenings or at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, between noon and, and 6 o'clock, Jesus Christ said, it is finished, he yielded up the ghost, and he died. As a matter of fact, they came to break his legs, and I said, he's dead already? How could this be? He did not bleed to death. But the emphasis on the blood of Jesus Christ takes us to what happened in his soul. And the life of the flesh is in the blood. That oxygen and the flesh combination that keeps you alive physically is another sign back to what he went through in his soul. We'll see that in a little bit. But we look at the blood then and we see there's indeed power there because of what it speaks of. When I see the blood, I will pass over you in judgment. The blood has to be applied. The blood is important uh, to God. So if you have believed in Christ as your Savior, when you come to the communion table, you're saying something. It's a statement of faith in the blood. All right, the second thing, verse number 16. The bread that we break, the cup of blessing, it's the communion of the blood. The bread that we break, it's the communion of the body of Christ. Now, just as the blood uh, speaks, uh, or the, 
uh, of a certain thing. You've got the wine that speaks of the blood, and the blood is even a, a, a type of a type, as we'll see. Communion of the body of Christ talks about what he did in his body. Now, what he did was, uh, was bear our sins uh, in his own body on the tree. And he went through torture, agony, suffering, everything necessary to punish our sins. He took it upon himself in his body. So if uh, you want to say, where is my salvation located? My salvation is located on the cross in the soul of Jesus Christ, what he did there, and in the body of Jesus Christ, what he did there in bearing um, our sins. So, if you will, come now with me to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. And we'll look at verse number 6. Now, it's an interesting thing regarding this communion uh, service, the Lord's Supper. Because except for the Word of God that we have here, the writings of Paul, basically everything else spiritual is not by sight, but by faith. And that's what he says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. He says, we, for we walk not by sight, but by faith. Uh, or, excuse me, we walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, <coughs> but you got the gist of it. You see, the elements. <laughs> now, uh, but when, when we come to the Lord's <coughs> table, the interesting thing about this is that salvation, our salvation is visualized. It's tangible. We hold it. We taste it. We eat it. We look at it. Uh, and it is, a, it is the one visible thing God wants throughout this dispensation of grace, wherein uh, our walk is not by seeing it. But when we come to the communion table, salvation is visualized. Now, verse number six, it says, All flesh shall see the salvation of God. So anybody who really wants to can look at the communion table, see what it symbolizes, and understand God's salvation. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take each part, each utensil, each element, and, uh, and look at what God says about it. Now, let's, um, let's look at the Passover, uh, which uh, the Lord's Supper was founded upon, and see something even in the Passover <coughs> that is a visual. Turn back with me to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. So the entire original Lord's Supper, uh, and you will excuse the phrase, but was a feast for the eyes as well as for the palate. It was something revealed in all of that went on there. And what is revealed is salvation. Chapter 52, verse number 10. It says there, The Lord has made bare His holy arm in the eyes of all nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Now, the word arm there is Zoroah. We find it in a very significant place. In other words, the Lord is going to say, I, my arm is going to provide salvation. I'm rolling up my sleeve. And everybody is going to see that arm. And that arm means salvation. Chapter 53. And it says, Who hath believed our report? Verse 1. And to whom, this is referring to Jesus Christ, is the arm of the Lord revealed. For he, the arm of the Lord, shall grow up before him as a tender plant and, and uh, the like. Uh, 
Verse 2 says, when we shall see him. Now, what it's talking about is God promised to bear his arm and let everybody see his salvation. And he uh, indeed uncovered or revealed his arm in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, today, under uh, the normal or original circumstances or conditions that the uh, Lord's Supper was based on was Passover. And they had the lamb with, the, with his bones there. But today, because we serve a kinder and gentler Passover, <laughs> you, you have the shank bone there. You just put the shank bone. And the shank bone is the same word, the roar or arm of the animal. And it refers to or pictures the arm of the Lord providing salvation. So they look at that shank bone and they see the arm. Now the same principle is involved then in the Lord's Supper. He took these things and he visualized salvation. Now, well, what is the, the first thing that uh, is emphasized? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And it says in verse number 21, very first part, you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord. So uh, if you come over to, to chapter 11, it says in, in verse number 26, middle part, as often as we <laughs> drink this cup, so now we come to the Lord's Supper. One of the very first things that are that is pronounced amongst all of them is the Lord's cup. It is the Greek word oterion, and it means a cup that is a drinking vessel. It has no other purpose than, uh, than to put liquid in so that a human being might uh, imbibe of the refreshment. Now, you and I have a favorite cups, um, coffee cups. We've got uh, one for, uh, uh, as a gift uh, this, uh, this past year, I've got it downstairs. It is the pastor's coffee cup. Uh, and uh, so it's just for that purpose, so that I might drink coffee from it. Got one uh, as well in, in the office. Uh, it's a little, a little messier, uh, perhaps, but by the end of the evening, it's cleaned up and ready to go for the next day. But uh, it holds coffee in it. And I drink it as I am coming up with all of these studies. Uh, it just uh, stimulates the brain, this, this coffee. But that's its purpose. It has no other purpose. It doesn't hold paint. It, it's not, not for that. There's no, no other liquids going to be in there. Time to time, water will go in there and I'll slosh down. But its main purpose is to put coffee in, uh, and, and I use it to, for that. It is a dedicated cup just for that. And that's what this is. It is a dedicated cup for the purpose of drinking. And note, as uh, we uh, talk here, it's only one cup. And this is important in uh, the fact that people of the world are looking for answers. People of the world are looking for solutions. Where do I go? Is there one place I can go to solve all of my spiritual problems, my sin problems and the like? And the answer is yes. Look back to the cup of the communion table. There's only one there. There's only one that all of the disciples participated in, in drinking from. And that's what it symbolizes the Lord's table. You have, have uh, sipped from the same cup that I have. There's only one of them. And uh, it is the one called the Lord's Cup. It is the, the cup of salvation that comes from God Himself. All right? Let's uh, go back to uh, chapter 10 again. And look at verse 21. We get a second instrument that is vital to eating. Hey, yeah, you ever tried eating standing up? <laughs> you ever tried eating uh, 
you've got all this stuff, soupy stuff, uh, and it's you're, you're not seated at the table. Everybody else is seated there, but there weren't enough chairs for you. You you take them, you have to stand up, and you're, you know, uh, the thing is dripping, and you, you can't seem to, to, to cut the meat and the like. Well, what do you need for that? You need a table, something solid, a firm foundation on which you can place these things, and you don't have to worry about holding it. The table is going to hold it, and that's the idea. You don't have to worry about holding your salvation. It's a table that God has provided. Uh, and it's as solid as God himself, and you just simply, the food is already in place. He put it there. You just simply take from it. And that's why it's called here. Middle part of the verse. We are partakers of the Lord's table. And it is a Greek word, trapeza. And it means a table on which food is placed and served. Uh, that is its purpose, again. Uh, it is specified by the Greek. Uh, it's not to be used for other things. Um, it is to be used for the placement of food. Now, uh, if you grew up uh, around a, a, a grandmother who was uh, an, an excellent cook and very, very fussy as to her, <laughs> you understand that that table is for the purpose of eating. Uh, if you need something to stand on to change a light bulb, you need something to, to stand on to, to paint or what have you, don't you dare put your foot on that table. That is there for one purpose only. I'm going to put my food there and you're going to take the food from it. Uh, it's a dedicated table. That's what it is used for. And that's all it was used for uh, as well. But that is uh, the idea of the Lord's Supper. You look at one table and you find there's only one place where God has set a table uh, and where God has provided that. And uh, uh, that is in the Lord's Supper. Salvation is, is going to be uh, taken from the cup. Salvation is to be taken from the table. So in all of these things, we see that salvation is visualized. All right, let's... Let's look at another angle or aspect of this. Titus chapter 1. Now what does God want us to see in these two elements? He wants us to see two aspects of his promise, a double promise. One was that he is going to have a plan of salvation ready to implement if necessary, and it was necessary. And secondly, that he worked the plan and fulfilled it. So he's got a provision of salvation. Titus chapter 1 and uh, verse number 2. In hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So, in time past, God is talking with the Son and with the Spirit at the Eternal Life Conference, and He says, this is what we're going to do. But because of free will, here's the kicker, guys. Um, angels are going to be able to sin uh, if, they, if they so desire. Humans will be able to. But because of that, we're going to have to put in effect a plan where we can redeem them back. We can reconcile, we can bring them back into the family. For those who say, well, that's what Lucifer did, that's what Adam did, but I don't want to join those fellows, I want to be on God's side. We've got to have this plan. So, I'm going to make a promise that, that we're going to do this, uh, and uh, salvation indeed had uh, a plan. Now, what is the plan with regard to the cup? 1 Peter chapter 1. you come to the Lord's table this morning in the, in the next hour and you hold that cup, you remember that God promised you eternal life in eternity past and that that cup symbolizes one part of the promise. That before you even existed in reality, He was making preparation for your salvation and your everlasting life. And the structure of that is seen um, in this cup. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse number 19. You're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. 
as of a lamb without spot or blemish, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Here's the plan. A plan of salvation based on the blood. What is going to hold the blood of Jesus Christ? The cup. Before the blood could be, uh, be spilled and gathered, you need to have a structure wherein that blood is going to make the plan, uh, the, the plan effective. And the structure is that cup. Uh, so the cup is a very, very important visual object in seeing that God had in mind all along our redemption if it came necessary with, uh, with man's sin. And uh, note in verse 20, it's the word foreordained. Pro gnosko, meaning to know or foreknow ahead of time. It is in the perfect tense here. So God said, that's it. I've, I've drawn up this perfect tense. It's complete. I don't have another plan. There's no other way of salvation. If Christ would have failed, that was, that's it. Kaput. Uh, the whole plan goes down the drain. Uh, but, but the plan is seen in, the structure is seen in this particular cup. Now, the same idea of a foreordained cup is seen in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Starting with verse number 22. And it says there, you men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by what he did. Verse 23, and here's the, here's the foreknowledge or preordained concept or the fact that God had on the table one plan and only one plan for the redemption of his universe. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Here is the plan, and God said, this is the, the direction we're going to go. And that's why Jesus could not pray, Father, give, give the cup to somebody else. Uh, uh, Father, can we do it another way? Once the plan was on the table and ratified by all three members, it was that plan or no plan. And so uh, that's why he says, Jesus Christ was delivered by the determinate counsel as seen in the structure of that cup and the foreknowledge of God. Ye have taken by wicked hands and have crucified him. That's the plan. Uh, that's what the cup represents. The death of the testator, uh, the death uh, of the mediator of the one plan. And it's called the new covenant. All right, let's go back to uh, uh, the book of Psalms. Chapter 23. I shouldn't go back there. I should just have you quote it. I know you know it. Psalms 23, but verse number 5. Now we come from the cup to the table. It too is a specific structure. Uh, understood by all as to what you do uh, on the table. What it's for. So in Psalms 23, verse number 5, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And that's the, the uh, whole purpose of this. You see a table in front of you, and they're all right, we're, we're going to eat? Yes. Well, whose table is it? Whose host? It's God's. And God has prepared for it. And so God's provision of salvation is seen in the table as God's plan of salvation is seen in the cup. Uh, and nothing can be more vivid or, or easily understood. Now from here, let's go back to Genesis 22 where we get, um, we get an idea that this is what God has had in mind all along. And it's, it's one of our favorites because... Of, of Isaac. Abraham tells Isaac, we're going to go up to the mountain. We're going to sacrifice the lamb. Oh, Dad and I get to go on a journey. <laughs> you know, you just see him as the uh, cartoons used to be when there were good cartoons. You know, the, 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 the person is excited and yes, yes, and doesn't understand that there is a downside to this trip. So, uh, it came to pass, verse number one, 
God did to test Abraham. He called him and he said, I want you to take your son, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there among the mountains. So Abraham rose up early. He sat on his ass, took a, a couple of others uh, with, uh, with him, Isaac, the wood and the, and, uh, the like. And he went up to Mount Moriah. And uh, he told the men, verse 5, just stay here. The lad and I are going to go up there alone and worship and come back. So Abraham took the wood, laid it on Isaac. He took the fire and the knife, and they both went up together. Now, on the way up here, there is something conspicuous by its absence. <laughs> we, we have got everything here, Dad, for the sacrifice, but something's missing. Where is the lamb? And it began to dawn on him now what, what's going to happen there. I suspect Abraham, his father, had said, My father, he said, Here am I. Behold the fire. Yes, son, we've got it. Behold the wood. Oh, absolutely. We couldn't, couldn't sacrifice without the wood. Uh, but where is the lamb? I want you to see what Abraham says. And that is what the table pictures. He says, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Now, you know the story. Abraham put Isaac on the altar. He bound him up. He put the wood under him to be burnt. He was coming down with the knife to plunge it in his heart. And God stopped him and said, that's fine. And he found a ram. So let's, uh, let's look at uh, this. Verse number 13. And Abraham lifted his eyes and behold, behind him a ram was caught in the thicket by his horns. Now, even this is, is picturesque. Uh, Jesus Christ had, had a dilemma, a twofold dilemma. Uh, with, even though he was powerful, which is uh, pictured by this, this male ram with the horns, he was caught. Uh, that ram was stuck. It, if, if Isaac was going to be redeemed, that ram had to be the one and only the sacrifice. So Jesus Christ was on the horns of a dilemma here. Uh, but he willingly gave himself as our substitute. So it says... Uh, where am I? Verse 13. He took the ram, offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son, and he called the place Jehovah Jireh. Uh, in the mouth of the Lord it shall be seen, or Jehovah has provided salvation. And, and so, we have a table, but the table is not uh, going to be empty. We have a table, but the table represents um, upcoming food to be placed and set for us to eat. Uh, and so all of this is very uh, uh, picturesque.